Let's look at an absolutely insane Chinese sword. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here of Scholar Gladiatoria. Now what we've got here is the LK Chen Twin Peaks Liao Dao. Uh, that means it's from the Liao Dynasty, which are from Northeast China, the Kaitan, or Kitan, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, people. In Northeastern China, uh, they're contemporaries of the Song Dynasty. We're talking about a thousand years ago. Now this particular recreation is based on, it's particularly based on one surviving example actually that's been found archeologically, but there are a bunch of Liao Dao um, that are similar-ish to this, similar blades at least. They vary somewhat in the hilts, and in many cases the hilts aren't remaining, only the tang remains. But nevertheless, you can see this is an absolute beast of a sword. Now, just to put this into historical context for what a wacky, weird, and amazing thing this is, this is from the same period that in Northwestern Europe, where I'm standing now in England, for example, we were using swords like this. This is an Anglo-Saxon um, style, but Viking era sword. And these were used with shields and spears and this kind of stuff. In China, there were various swords in use. There were um, early forms of one-handed Dao, which eventually would go on into the Ming Dynasty and develop into things like this. Um, and indeed, there were two-handed versions of Dao as well, which would go on to develop into things like this with some Japanese influence as well, which we've looked at in previous videos. Also, of course, there was the Jian, the straight double-edged sword, and this was the most, probably the most common type of sword at the time. We're talking around 1000 AD by conventional dating. But this, as you can see, is something entirely different. Now, what's interesting is these Liao Dao are particularly associated with the Liao uh, dynasty, with the uh, Kaitan people. So there must have been something particular about them, their warfare, their neighbors. We're talking northeastern China here, um, the people who they were fighting against, the type of uh, terrain, the type of armor. So what could it be that would have inspired weird swords like this? Well, first of all, what is so weird about it? First of all, the shape. You can see it's got a massively long grip. It's not really a pole arm, but it's going in that direction. It's almost like a short glaive. Now, funnily enough, if we look at 15th century Europe, we do see weapons which look really quite uncannily similar to this, and they would be referred to as glaives. So if we were just talking completely in English language, 100% I would call this a short glaive. Now if we use anthropological methodology and say that we don't really know why these were being used in a thousand years ago China, but if we look at medieval Europe, 15th, 16th century Europe, why were weapons like this being used? And basically the answer is armor, okay? Why do you need such a big beefy blade? Now, I mentioned the statistics of this. Not only is this a relatively short blade, actually, it's, it's a big polearm size, so it's about 30 inches, I think 29 inches. So it's shortish for a sword. Well, it'd be okay for a one-handed sword, but it's shortish for a two-handed sword. Although, you have to say, it is comparable with something like a tachi or um, a large katana, an katana, for example. But nevertheless, this is a medium length blade. It's not, you're not gaining reach from this. So one of the things by making this weapon giant and massive, it's not that we're getting longer reach. You're not really. The only way you could possibly caveat that statement is by saying, well, if you slip the hand down, then indeed you do gain extra reach. And that quite likely, quite possibly is something that is done in striking as you would do with uh, something like, and I grab behind me, can you guess? The Danax. Uh, so indeed, the Danax, if you hold it up here, you don't have a long reach, but when you swing it, if you slide the hand down, you now have a long reach, and then you choke back up and you've got a lot more control to reload for the next blow. So entirely possible, yes, you can do that with this weapon. It has some of the benefits of a pole arm, some of the benefits of a sword, um, but it's heavy. It's five pounds, which for a weapon of this size is really quite beefy, but not if we compare it to glaives, other types of pole arm, things like halberds and stuff, even large spears, and pole axes, okay? So again, we're coming back into where in history when we see relatively heavy, relatively beefy and big bladed, medium length pole arms used, pole arm sword hybrids used, is when armor is a factor. Now, my understanding is that in this period, 
It is possible and likely that lamella armor, early forms of lamella armor, probably most of the time made from leather but sometimes metallic as well, was perhaps increasingly a feature. So, my hypothesis, and this remains to be uh, researched further and investigated, is that this is essentially a specialised armoured fighting weapon. I don't think that it's particularly a weapon that someone is going to want to use if they are themselves lightly equipped, because your best equipment, if you are lightly equipped, uh, is going to be your primary weapon is either going to be a long spear or halberd or a, a bow or a crossbow. And in that case, you're most likely going to have a conventional one-handed sword as a backup. Or later on in the Ming Dynasty, we find that crossbowmen, because they couldn't carry shields, had a large two-handed sword, which has great reach and is quite a formidable weapon by itself as a backup. So those things aside, why would you lumber a soldier with a weapon that's heavy and cumbersome and means they can't use a shield, they can't wear it very easily, and they can't carry something like a long pike or a halberd or a bow very easily, and the answer to me has to be these are for armoured shock troops to fight a lot of the time other armoured people. But I think a lot of the time people look at weapons and say, what's this for using against? But often you've got to think about what is this, what are you wearing and how are you equipped that enables you to use this weapon? This weapon would be effective against anyone. It doesn't matter if it's a lightly armoured archer or a pikeman or a crossbowman or indeed the equivalent of a knight, a fully armoured person. It doesn't matter who it is, this weapon's going to be effective against all of those people. But if I myself am lightly equipped, this is not a great weapon. It doesn't have great reach, it's not nimble, it means I can't carry a shield, so on and so forth. I can't wear it very easily as a backup weapon. So if this is a primary weapon and this is for me going in and carving up and stabbing the enemy and using in all of the sorts of ways that I want to use it, this, I think, has to be used by someone wearing lots of armour, like a medieval knight was. And that's why these sorts of weapons were most often in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe, used by people wearing quite a lot of armour. So, this is a very, very interesting weapon and very different to lots of the other Chinese weapons of the time. We should also mention that, of course, the glaive was popular in medieval Europe, but the glaive was also popular, also called a Dao, incidentally, it was popular in China. So, this blade or blades very like it could be married to a longer shaft and used by more lightly equipped troops. So, indeed, your rank and file, if they've only got a modicum of armour, so relatively light armour, then you might equip things that have blades like this on longer poles. But if you've got something that only has a short shaft like this, which we know these did because of the pommel there, which tells us how long it was, because you can't have any shaft going beyond that, I think these have to have been used by relatively armoured people. Now, brief review, uh, LK Chen's um, rendition of this looks very, very like the example that I have seen uh, in photographs, and uh, the statistics are based exactly on that. So LK Chen is very stringent about getting all of the weights, the distal taper, and everything else right. And I will tell you that these weapons are monstrously thick down at the base here, nearly a centimetre thick, and it tapers all the way to the tip. So actually, although this is five pounds, it's five pounds that actually rotates very easily around its point of rotation where your lead hand is. So it moves really quite naturally. The blade also has great edge geometry. So it is a wedge. Although it's a thick spine at the back, the bevel goes in a straight line to the edge. So that is hella sharp um, and it is a true wedge. So it, it's, I, I've only cut lightly with this so far. It's raining, it's bucket loads down at the moment, so I can't do any cutting demonstrations with this right now. But when I open this up on some cutting, I think it's going to be absolutely shocking. The guard, beautifully done. It's a nice big guard, much like uh, a Suba, essentially, like you might find on a Japanese sword. That, incidentally, is an interesting development because disc guards appear roughly at the same time in China and Japan, uh, around 1000 AD, maybe 900 AD. Um, and so where do they come from? Who invented them first? We don't know. This is an open question that I've addressed in previous videos, but I'd like to come back to it at a further point. It has essentially what's the equivalent of a fuchi, um, and we find this on later Chinese swords as well. So this prevents the top of the grip splitting because it has a tang which goes down inside the wood, of course. 
and if you were applying huge amounts of force, especially holding it further down the grip, smashing someone in the helmet or the shield or the pole arm shaft or whatever, hitting really hard here, you could run the risk of this grip splitting and that holds everything together. And even if you do get a split, it stops it traveling and coming off the tang. So even if you get a split in the wood in use, you can still use the weapon effectively. Finally, that weird pommel, <laughs> and I can't say I love this. I think it looks weird, it feels a little bit weird, but once you've used the weapon for a while, so long as you don't sort of bring the hand into contact with it, it kind of doesn't matter that it's there. Why is it such a big flat plate? I honestly don't know. Theoretically, yes, you could strike with it and it would be a little bit more effective than a blunt, um, than a blunt pommel. It's not sharp or anything like that, but it is nevertheless narrow-edged. Uh, it's interesting. I think it's a bit ugly. One thing I will say, minor um, negative point here, so LK Chen's reproduction sent to me to review, quite a long time actually ago, it's been sitting around for a long time. When it arrived, this hasn't happened during my, um, when I've got it, when it arrived it does have a little split in the wood uh, coming down there, which you might be able to see, where the wood has been fitted to the tang. Now an interesting thing, um, these grips are made in two halves and glued either side of the tang because that pommel is fixed to the tank so you can't slide the grip on and then put the pommel on you have to fit the grip around the tank with the pommel in situ and in this case the wood has developed a split to down there now that's not structurally a problem if i squeeze it the gap actually closes up so what i need to do is pump some wood glue in there and clamp it and it'll be absolutely fine i don't think there's a lot of stress down there most of the stress is up here so i don't think structurally it will be a problem but nevertheless i have to mention it because i try to be fair and open with all my reviews so the uh, twin peaks liao dao an absolutely fascinating uh, weapon that really is not a sword in my mind. I would call it a glaive, and it's most similar to uh, certain types of, if we can just extract this, it's actually most similar to things like pole axes and glaives from medieval Europe, I think, in terms of its application, use, and even physical characteristics, its weight, its balance, these kind of things. It balances in the middle. Um, and it weighs about five plus pounds. So uh, very interesting weapon um, that yet again, might hint at an anthropological comparison between thousand years ago uh, China, which remember we were using these in Europe at that time, and later, 500 years later, medieval Europe. I hope this has been interesting. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you back on the channel soon. Cheers, folks.